First, I'll ask you a silly question. How does the area of this square compare to the area of this square? Four times larger, right? What if I asked you to prove it? How would you do it? Prove it. Again, I think you're beginning to get a feel for the standard we're going for, right? How is it clear geometrically? Yeah, you would divide it into four, and you'll say, hey, there are four squares here, and each one is as big as this one, so it's four times bigger. And I'm completely satisfied with this. And I'll ask you the same question about circles. How do you compare the area of this circle to the area of this circle and why? And then I'll challenge your answer. Can I tell you the right answer? It's four. And let me give you the reason that I won't accept because I want a more basic reason. First of all, I want to write down the number four because it's a very, very simple answer. With the number four, very much unlike root two, which I feel comfortable with because the roof of my house hasn't collapsed, but that's really the only reason why. Because I can't write it in decimal, I can't represent it as a fraction, I can't do anything with it. But I can do enough with it that I've gotten used to it. With the number four, I have no such qualms. Number four, I'm so comfortable with, you know? Like, I like to have four million dollars. Yeah, it's such a comfortable number. Yeah, four, no question about it. But how do you get to the number four? Well, here's, here's the reason which will convince you, but it won't be good enough for us from the point of view of simplicity. Well, the formula is pi r squared for the area. So if you plug in 2r for r, you get four times the answer for this circle, right? Yeah. Is everybody convinced that the answer is four? Okay, but... Yeah, but let's now talk about what's bothering us. First of all, I don't know what pi is, so we'll talk about that a little bit. If square root of 2 is a problem, then oh boy is pi a problem. Uh, people, so the Greeks realized that square root of 2 was not a ratio of two numbers, of two integers. Uh, for pi, it took another 2,000 years. I forget who was the first one to prove it. I've read some of them. I don't remember them. If you put me on the spot now, I wouldn't be able to produce the argument. Why? Pi is what we call irrational. So we don't know what pi is. But the other thing is that our standard is, if we're saying, forget about this, which has a lot of things that are unclear about it, pi being one of them, right? This is what we want to do. We want to fit four of these inside here. So how do we do that? So if the answer is four, we should vary such a simple answer. We'll, we all love it. How do we fit four of these into this? Huh. And so this is what I promised you at the beginning of the lecture, right? A, a, not a simple question, not an obvious question, but a question you should ask very early on, right? Uh, just as a, as a, totally stumps us, right? We're used to pi r squared, and now we all see that it's four, because it's quadratic, r squared, you know, but, but really, this is the kind of argument that makes it clear. How do we do the same thing here? Is it possible? Because the answer is 4, it's not even root 2, it's not even an irrational number, it's not even pi, it's just 4. It's the simplest answer in the world. So how do we fit 4 of these into this? Well, let me just put in a big inscribed square in here. Okay, <laughs> right? So this square, area-wise, is four times this square. We know that from here, right? And that already captures so much of the circle, but not the entire circle. Okay, so what about, well, let me fill it in. Let me put a little square in here and here and a square here. All four of them are the same size. My drawing is imperfect. And the corresponding square is here, here. I'm just trying to fill in the circle. Please forgive the imperfection of the drawing. Like here, it clearly should have been a little fatter. Okay? So, this picture remains twice this big. It's just zoomed in by a factor of two. So each one of these little squares, these little squares is four times bigger than these area-wise. Do you agree? And so I can keep doing that, right? 
And so you could say, I'll do this to infinity, and then the whole circle will get filled. But I don't think you need to say that. You can just say, I can do this better and better, and the ratio will always stay 4 of the areas that are filled. And because for any areas that I'm filling in this fashion, the ratio is 4, I feel comfortable, I feel comfortable that the answer is 4 for the circles themselves. Because no matter, as long as I keep the picture similar, if I was filling, if, you know, arbitrarily filling it in with squares and replicating it here, the filled parts will be in proportion 4 to, four to 1. Okay? And that convinces me that it's the same areas for the circle. And so if you're not convinced by that argument, you could wait, maybe let some time pass as you think about it and you get used to it. Right? You could try to refine it, but I think that's a rabbit hole of rigor. And you'll just discover things that, even, that are even less clear. Okay? Uh, but this should make you feel, maybe, maybe this will make you feel comfortable. We're sort of debating this whole infinity question, right? but we still haven't defined what area means, you know, or what the length means, or any of these things. So we're operating with concepts that we haven't defined, and if we try to define it, some books on analysis do it by actually this way and just taking the limit. And I think that doesn't clarify anything. I think it just complicates things, right? But I think this, this is a very nice argument that actually convinces us that the largest circle is four times the smaller circle, area-wise. And actually we realize this is not at all limited to circles. It's any shape. If we zoom in by a factor of two, if we double all linear dimensions, the area will increase by a factor of four. That the area just grow, grows quadratically with linear dimension. So yes, every shape acts like the square. And the square we understand, but it's any shape, because we can put enough squares into it to make ourselves comfortable that, yes, it'll just remain 4 to 1 ratio. So it's kind of nice. Yeah, nice argument, right? And to me, this is how you work with infinities. You kind of, yes, there is something, I would have to do it infinitely. There's kind of infinity in here. But at first, just to get used to infinities, you have to do it in such a way that it kind of appears, but then disappears, and we're left with a very, very clean answer. That's four, right? Very clean, uh, an integer, not, not even a fraction, let alone rational number or transcendental number. Yes. I think I could also bypass infinities by making a careful argument that if I'm wrong and if this ratio is actually 4.01 then I could tell you just how far I have to go with this refinement procedure to expose this difference. I'm just throwing something out but I won't go into details. That's sort of what theory of limits and Cauchy's approach to limits attempts to do. It attempts to replace infinities the word all with the word any, right? It's a subtle psychological shift that fools us into complacency until you dig deeper and realize it's even more unclear than before. So you just have to get used to these arguments and embrace them. And this is a nice case where infinity can be bypassed by saying, I can just make them finer and finer, and at each point the ratio is 4, so it just has to be four for the circle itself, as I understand the area. And it's amazing that it's necessary for such a basic question of which of the ratio of the areas of two circles, so uh, related by a factor of two. Such a basic question allows you to go into infinities. Isn't that amazing? I think it's kind of amazing, because infinities didn't enter your lives until you were you know, 15 or 16, right? But you need them for a question as basic as this, for a shape as basic as this. And fortunately, it covers all shapes, helps with all shapes. And yeah, and so 
Another thing that happens is when you great, get comfortable with arguments like that, where you can circumvent the concept of infinity and get to a nice clean answer, uh, then you become comfortable with uh, types of analyses where infinity becomes part of the answer. It's kind of that intermediate state. And it's the big O notation, you know, this, this goes to zero faster than this, this goes to zero in such a rate, and you start being comfortable working with infinities uh, when it's part of the answer, just like with complex numbers, or maybe even with negative numbers, right? At first you accepted negative answers when it was just a stepping stone towards the, towards the final answer, where the answer is a nice positive number. That's how humanity came to terms with negative numbers, it took a couple thousand years. And complex numbers were, I think, crazier, uh, much more brilliant of an invention, I think, took more, I don't know, I don't know, but took a lot less time to accept. And again, at first it was, you can use complex numbers as long as your answer is a real number. And then you do that for a few decades, and then you get comfortable with the answer being 4 plus i because you know what to do with it. All about getting used to it.